Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite movies, music, TV shows, and more. We are your midnight society of microscopic detail. I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtog. And Jordan, today we are talking about the outlier in uh, Nickelodeon's 90s cavalcade, the show that taught a generation of children to fear, nestled, <laughs> nestled as it was in the otherwise comedic bosom of the network's SNCC programming block. That's right. We're talking about Are You Afraid of the Dark? Man, I used to watch a show a lot. I still vividly remember the tale of the water demons. Is that the one uh, in the sw- in the indoor swimming pool? Uh, it's the one with like the undead sailors coming, coming oh, after the kids. Oh yeah, that yeah, scared yeah. the ever loving piss out of me. And then only later did I realize it is just basically the plot of the John Carpenter movie, The Fog. So it just all comes back to old JC for me. Um, but I'm guessing this show, uh, would have put a little too much starch into your cardigan as a kid. (laughs) No, I actually, this was probably the first example of must see TV I ever had in my life. I barely, I never missed this every weekday at either, it was either five or five 30. I forget. I was in front of the TV watching this. I couldn't get enough. I adored it so much. And, but you're right. I'm not a big horror guy, but my tastes do have a dark streak that offsets my sunny exterior, mm-hmm. which I feel like I haven't really gotten the show off much on this show, but it'll come. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I liked Are You Afraid of the Dark because it wasn't blood and gore, which isn't really my thing, but it was just creepy and eerie, which yeah. was more my speed. I mean, my favorite episode was the one about the haunted jukebox, the tale of C seven mm-hmm. where the listener would hit c7 and some old swing band song would play and they'd be transported back in time to like this welcome home party of a world war ii soldier you and, and your time travel i know yeah i know <laughs> i know it explains a lot but i haven't seen that episode in probably like 20 years but i just remember it being really like poignant and eerie and sad and it, it just it kind of introduced me to the concept of stories that give you goosebumps Mm. which you would have thought I would have learned from the Goosebumps series. <laughs> but uh, no, this was a huge show for me. And it was one that I watched with my mom a lot, who was very dispositionally similar to me. She was very sweet and sunny on the surface, but had a secret love of the dark side. So I, I definitely have a soft spot for it. Um, I kind of feel like it's underrated or memory hold. I feel like it doesn't get the props that like Legends of the Hidden Temple does. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into it, but I think a lot of that is just because it wasn't on streaming for the longest time. You had to watch it on like YouTube um, because there's damn Canadians. (laughs) Uh, But we'll get into it. Don't worry. But yeah, I think you're right. I think it has been maybe memory hold a little bit. It's not whimsical like Keenan and Kel or, um, you know, groundbreaking maybe the way that all that was or or even Ren Ren and Stimpy Stimpy, it's just it was like the weird outlier in Nickelodeon but it holds up it does hold up you know it sticks with you it haunts you it does (laughs) well so from the staggering roster of pre-famed child actors who populated the show to creator DJ McHale's burning hatred of both the Midnight Society and Canadian television to the show's groundbreaking representation and diversity Here is everything you didn't know about Are You Afraid of the Dark? The show's creator, DJ McHale, was an NYU film grad. Sorry about that, Jordan. Uh, (laughs) Wear that as a badge of honor. (laughs) Created one of my favorite shows. who, uh, Who told Vulture in 2012 he was getting nowhere writing screenplays. Same. But he had a day job that involved traveling internationally, making corporate and educational videos. You didn't do that, did you? That's kind of what this is. It's yeah, an educational... Okay. Uh... No travel, though. <laughs> no. But on the advice of a friend, at some point he pivoted into writing children's media. Uh, he actually got to start on ABC After School Specials, which he mentions later helped him kind of bring the gravitas of those shows uh, with, like, quote-unquote, real kids and, like, real problems. That's how he grounded all the stories of uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? into like real life kids uh but then he did episodes of uh, encyclopedia brown for hbo which i did not know was a show 
I didn't something either. called Criss Cross. But it was on Encyclopedia Brown that he met his partner, Ned Candle, and they developed a pitch that he told Vulture was bedtime stories for lazy parents <laughs> that they wanted to do by, quote, taking some old time actor who was out of work, but whom everyone knew, sort of a Hal Holbrook or uh, <laughs> uh, who else? George Kennedy would have been good for that. Uh, Carl Malden. Carl Malden. And put him in an easy chair with a roaring fire and a big book, and he'd tell fairy tales. We'd record them and put a home video package together for parents who wouldn't necessarily want to sit down and do this themselves for their kids. That's a quote from him. I mean, th yeah. thus begins a recurring theme in this episode, which is that the creator of Are You Afraid of the Dark has a really low opinion of humanity. <laughs> Yeah, I also didn't even put any of the quotes he's given to multiple outlets about how much he hates the state of children's television now. Yeah, yeah. And in Disney it, in particular. Um, but it was while experiencing writer's block as to what these tales would actually be that Mikhail realized the stories that he liked best as a kid were the scary ones. And so they decided to do away with what he called the creepy concept of having an old dude talk to kids and just have the kids themselves do the work by telling the stories around a campfire. I tried to look up the trope of scary tales being told around a campfire, and it, it, it literally, it like crashed the computer. It's, it's like so <laughs> old. TV Tropes has an entry called Around the Campfire Exposition, which is a term for like when characters are sitting around a campfire talking and like divulging stories from their past. Oh, like in Stand By Me with the, the pie contest when Gordy tells like the short story. And, yeah. And then in the Sandlot, too, when they're talking about, you know, forever and the story of the bees. Uh uh, Kill Bill when David Carradine goes, tells the whole story about... Anyway, so that's the bit that they decided to do. <laughs> and you know what you do to the bit? <laughs> you commit to the bit. And he did. Against his better judgment, he did. He grew to hate that bit. But... <laughs> I love it. But we'll get back to that. Yeah, we'll get back to that. He really, I mean, I guess it really shouldn't surprise me that the creator of Are You Afraid of the Dark is a huge misanthrope, but he's a salty dude. Yeah, I love it. This DJ McHale. <laughs> I love it so much. He's a quote machine. But yes, perhaps unsurprisingly, Nickelodeon shot the show down when McHale and Candle pitched it initially. The working title was Scary Tales, a pun on fairy tales. Get it? It's all about how you emphasize it. Scary Tales sounds lame. Scary Tales, oh, good idea. Scary so Tales. All, yeah, exactly. But in Matthew Clickstein's incredible book, Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's golden age, it was explained that this title was actually already taken, which kind of makes sense. That's a really good title. <laughs> is it? Anyway, I think he, it is. Mikhail told Vulture, uh, there was a scary story written by Dr. Seuss called What Was I Scared Of? And I always loved that story. So I took that title and thought, well, I was afraid of clowns and I was afraid of the dark. And that's where the title of our show came from. Kind of as an answer to that Dr. Seuss title. Mine is, uh, do you ever think about how you're going to be remembered after you die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the adult remake of Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> do, you, do you think about your bills, your ex, your deadlines, or when you think yeah. you're going to die? <laughs> <laughs> Mikhail explained to Complex in 2014, we pretty much pitched exactly what we ended up making, and they were just like, no, you can't do this. You can't scare kids. It's not going to fly. <laughs> um, DJ McHale hates Nickelodeon and Disney and children. Yeah, but, his, his unabashed contempt towards Nickelodeon is, is so hilarious to me. But he in, somehow decided to just leave a three-page treatment of the show in their slush pile, I guess, in their submissions pile. And, and in the year between that original pitch meeting... And then he and Kendall returned to pitch another show, which also did not get picked up. Uh, Nickelodeon hired an executive named Jay Mulvaney, who also had a hand in greenlighting The Adventures of Pete and Pete, which rules. And that guy just kind of came across the treatment in their submissions pile. And he literally said, supposedly, why have we not made this yet? And I read that Terry Castle, who is the daughter of... Um, the legendary low-budget horror flick director William Castle. She also worked on this show, which gives oh, wow. it a sort of bona fide uh, place in the lineage of, uh, of of horror films. And William Castle's the smell of vision guy, right? The guy who had all these uh, the multi-sensory things in the theaters. Yeah, the Tingler was one where he had uh, like joy buzzers like rigged into the seats of the <laughs> of the theater, so he would be <laughs> That's like, obscene. "It's incredible." The the movie would stop, and they would broadcast an announcement. The movie was about this like little thing that like ran up people's legs and like shocked them or whatever and uh the movie would stop and the you would hear a voice broadcast into the theater and someone would go ladies and gentlemen 
this is not a joke. The tingler is loose in the theater. Do not panic. And then they would electrify all the seats and uh, people would lose their shit. He also had a thing um, that he would just run a, a ghost on a on a wire from the back of the theater to the oh, front that of the theater. Rules. Yeah, he was William Castle, real uh, in the P.T. Barnum mold of like classic American huckster. Um, Nickelodeon did not want to commit to funding the whole thing despite picking it up, and so Mikhail and Candle had to uh, trek it across the border to the Bacony Tundra of Canada and the production <laughs> company Sinar. Um, Tundra. <laughs> Our crude neighbors to the north. Uh, <laughs> crude. I'm just going to shit on Canada this whole time. <laughs> Sorry, Canadian listeners. Um, which, as we'll discuss later, complicated the rights ownership situation to this. Sinar is actually now defunct, but they were responsible for beloved children's <laughs> series of the era, like The Busy World of Richard Scarry, Arthur, and uh, Caillou. So Sinar's agreement required that the show be shot in Canada, uh, which Mikhail told Vulture was partially due to the sorry state of the Canadian film industry at the time. Uh, when we first started shooting the show, 91-92, the film industry in Montreal was doing very badly, he said. We were the only game in town, so we had the run of the place. All this great stuff for a low-budget show. As the seasons progressed and the film industry picked up in Montreal, the offices weren't as nice anymore. <laughs> Um, the campfire scenes were shot in a soundstage. How about that? In Quebec. How about that? That do anything for you? You been to Quebec? <laughs> what do you think about Canada? Uh, never been to Quebec. Vancouver. Very nice. Very yeah. green. Very yeah. lush. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. like Canadian bacon? I uh, bet you yeah. do. You like curling? <laughs> I bet you do, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You like curling? Uh, I like putting the U in color. And yeah, you favorite. got like a, yeah. you got like a toque. You got the like little, little hat with the... A little bobby that's what they call the ski cap a toque i uh, that i've never heard yeah i think it's one of their is weird... it like the hat that pete wears in pete and pete with like the things that come down over the ears no it's just like a ski hat oh huh. or like a beanie on yeah top. it's like yeah it's like a beanie it huh. comes from it's from the bastardized french what does the french word mean um your mom's a french teacher so i assume this is all very near and dear to you well toque is a from toka from Spanish, meaning woman's headdress. From Arabic, from the old Persian, tak, meaning veil, shawl. Um, toque is actually what you call the in, in a chef's uniform. Toque blanche is the the mushroomy oh, yeah, chef's yeah. hat. But in Canada, they call beanies what we would call a beanie or a ski cap. Call them toques. Anyway, production did not want to repeatedly build and tear down this set that they built for the campfire scenes so that meant that all the wraparound all the framing devices for an entire season had to be filmed over the course of a couple of weeks so all the intros and outros yep so it not only meant that first of all they would just have all these kids there for like two or three weeks at a time and then these kids would never see each other again for the rest of the year but it meant that they while they didn't have to have everything scripted in advance they had to have the whole season planned out they had to know for each and every episode what it was going to be so the kids could intro it. And yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the kids had talked about this as like summer camp be, or an acting camp because they would see each other for like a maximum of three weeks. And then I've heard I've heard that they crammed a season's worth of these into one week, which seems insane. But I've also heard it took up to three. So I mean, it's like three minute intros and like a 60 second outro, though, I feel like. It's yeah. Not, yeah. I mean, but they're, I, child, they're children actors. So, you know, you got to great on a curve here i mean i mostly feel bad for the show's creator dj McHale because he's talked about what a massive stressor this was making sure that the stories were if not completely scripted at least fleshed out enough to have details in this intro and he wrote or at very least seriously rewrote every single one of these shows for the first yep. seven seasons a total of 91 episodes just the thought of that makes me want to break out in hives that definitely seems <laughs> like some situation i'd get myself mixed up in but what actually helped this horrific scenario as far as writers were concerned was that nickelodeon was still really wary of selling children horror and suspense stories so they told mikhail but are you afraid of the dark had to draw some of its inspiration from the world of literature Basically, it's a sort of shield against complaints from parents. Uh, that way, this is what Mikhail told Complex, if somebody complained, we could say, what are you talking about? That's classic fiction. That's Daphne du Maurier. That's Edgar Allan Poe. 
For example, they do an episode that's basically the W.W. Jacob short story, The Monkey's Paw. Uh, the Tale of the Phone Police had echoes of George Orwell's 1984. And season two's The Tale of the Dream Machine has common ground with Stephen King's short story, Word Processor of the Gods. But aside from the aforementioned Fog ripoff episode, they also had one that was a riff on Nosferatu. So they didn't totally adhere to just literature only. But uh, yeah, they definitely made sure a lot of times that they went with stories that had a precedent so that they could fall back on that. But it sounds like nobody really complained. I was going to say, supposedly they did not get one complaint from parents about this show, which is just, I guess, a testament to how well they walk yeah. that line of not being explicit and gory but still scaring these kids but not actually featuring anything that objectionable yeah because i remember being terrified yes 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 you yes. know wow, it's, it's so great anyway uh as part of his herculean efforts mikhail location scouted all over montreal for eerie spooky places to shoot they were granted permission to film in cemeteries but there were laws against showing the real names on the headstones uh, of the dearly departed on television so their solution was to cart in a bunch of fake foam tombstones that they would set up that they would to strategically block the names of the people from the shots uh, and the fake ones all have different like easter egg references to members of the production staff there's a guy named uh, Paul Doyle who's a story editor on the show and he uh, told the Globe and Mail that he remembered seeing one Late at night in the editing bay, like doing his edits, and he saw one that said, here lies blind Paul, which he um, assumed was a shot at his editing skills. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, to this day, DJ denies he was commenting on my editing with that. <laughs> And for the scenes that were set in the deep, dark woods, DJ McHale said that they secured permission for an arboretum to shoot there. But because of the protected animals and wildlife, he says, quote, you couldn't use any insecticides to kill the mosquitoes, which swarm that place like a freaking horror movie. The crew would have these beekeeper outfits, good Lord, and gloves because <laughs> it was just so vicious. And I remember the actress Mia Kirshner doing a soliloquy, playing this possessed girl, and this mosquito landed on her nose, and she tried so hard to stay in character, and then just said i can't take this anymore <laughs> i oh man that's sad there was a, a location that he picked a water purification plant dating back from the 30s that had a bunch of these enormous tanks that the location scout took him to and it inspired the episode the tale of the hatching which is about a private boarding school that turns out is run by lizard people oh that's this the one with the terrifying skull monster thing in the indoor pool my sister was afraid of indoor pools she might still be to this day because <laughs> of watching that's the one i was thinking of when we were talking earlier yeah that one's terrifying yes 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 funnily enough this is the second most famous water purification plant in canada um there's one called the rc harris water treatment plant that uh is famously used in a bunch of different movies because it looks like this it's, it is a big imposing like public works building um it has been used in half baked it has been used in john carpenter in the john carpenter movie in the mouth of madness it is uh played a mental institution in strange brew uh it played an asylum insane asylum in robocop the television series it plays a children's hospital in the 1997 cockroach themed horror movie mimic um, and it is just recently featured in Nightmare Alley, the other Guillermo del Toro movie. So you do a you could do a tour of Canadian water treatment plants that have been f featured in horror media, and it would be two stops long. But what a rewarding <laughs> afternoon that would be! Anyway, <laughs> writer director Ron Oliver uh, did explain that there were some growing pains uh, involved in shooting this thing in Canada. He said, even though DJ had assembled a really good, smart crew. They were primarily French, so it was a little bit tricky sometimes, and we'd have communications breakdowns here or there. Oh, I love that. Um, but yes, as many people have surmised over the years, the submitted for your approval line was, in fact, a direct nod to the Twilight Zone. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, that was how host and creator Rod Serling would introduce the show's segments. Um, can you do a Serling? I almost need, like, the rhythm of... I can't do his voice, but... I submitted for your approval. Submitted for your approval. Of the, no, yeah, I can. I'm doing the kid from uh, from Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yeah, no, I don't think I can. <laughs> uh, well, the Twilight Zone was an important tonal reference for Mikhail. He described Are You Afraid of the Dark as a mix of Twilight Zone and, of course, Alfred Hitchcock presents. <laughs> 
feeling that uh, it's slotted more into the suspense category rather than horror. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that distinction is really interesting to me. DJ McHale has talked a lot about the psychology of horror and how people with the most intense imaginations often react the strongest to it because it's less about what you're actually seeing on the screen and more about what you might see. And that's sort Mm. of the first rule of Hitchcockian suspense. The implication of what's behind the door is much scarier than you actually seeing it. And Spielberg did the same thing. Thing, although by necessity in Jaws, you know, you rarely see the shark. And honestly, when you do, it's kind of a letdown. Whatever's in your head is scarier. Um, Mikhail has also talked about being traumatized by scary visuals as a kid. He said, I'd see a horror movie and I don't even remember what the horror movie was about. I just remember the face of some horrible thing. I'd have nightmares about that face. So in the beginning, I was thinking, I don't want to present any seeding horrible image that may stick with a kid. <laughs> but then he sort of slipped and put in stuff like that horrifying clown, Ooh, Zemo the clown. clown. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, for me, it was the little girl in the tale of the lonely ghost. Remember that? Like little girl looks like the little girl from the ring, but she's in this room where she just oh, scrawled yeah, help yeah. me all over the wall. Like, good God. Yeah. As you meditate on that, we'll be right back with more too much information after these messages. Speaking of children, now we must get to the Midnight Society, a key element of the show that Mikhail innovated and then quickly decided he hated. <laughs> Just, I love how apathetic he seems towards these kids. And he admitted that because they only filmed for like a week or two each season, they didn't really bond like most casts do, like you mentioned earlier. In an interview with Vox, he talks about how the one and only team bonding trip that they ever took backfired on him terribly he said i took them all bowling one night and i hurt my back that night bowling to this day it still bothers me i took the midnight society bowling and now i have a bad back (laughs) side note who do you think hated kids more richard donner the director of the goonies or dj McHale on are you afraid of the dark i mean richard donner had to deal with uh cory feldman yeah Feldman. okay yeah fair 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 Anthology shows are really tough to do, and they're really tough to get popular because people watch their favorite TV shows to see what's going to happen to their favorite characters, Mikhail told Complex. What's the continuing story? What's going to happen to Bill this week? Well, anthology shows don't have that. It's a different cast every week. So I said, okay, we need a linchpin that'll tie this thing together every episode. We needed the same kids every week who obviously would be the show's answer to Rod Serling. They're the closest thing to continuing characters we'd have on the show. But the fact is, he continued, the whole time I was making that show, I cared so little about the Midnight Society. (laughs) It was an annoyance. To me, the Midnight Society was never the interesting part about that show. The interesting part was the little movies that we made. It used to crack me up when people would say, I like this Midnight Society better than that Midnight Society. Or, I like this kid in the Midnight Society better than that kid. I was always like, who cares? That's not what the show is about. (laughs) He was right. (laughs) Yeah. But admirably, he did not half-ass it when it came to casting this crew, which he'd grow to hate. Despite living (laughs) in Los Angeles, McHale embarked on what he actually called the Magical Mystery Tour, hitting Vancouver, Toronto, New York, and Montreal for casting sessions in each of those cities for a new cast of kids every season. And this grueling circuit had its drawbacks. Uh, He said, there was one year when I hit Montreal, I started feeling sick. I had a fever. I came out of the shower in the hotel one day and I saw a red dot on my chest and thought, oh no. So I called (laughs) the production doctor and I said, I think I have chicken pox. I've never had chicken pox. We traced it back. I would see thousands of kids to some audition in Vancouver. That's how I got chicken pox. I was quarantined for 10 days in Montreal while prepping for the show. He said the worst part of his quarantine was Canadian television. <laughs> but he was happy that both the, um, the Knicks, he was, he's a New Yorker, he said, but no, both the Knicks and the Rangers were in the playoffs that year. So he got to watch them rather than uh, curling, which was what was usually on television. <laughs> Hold up watching sports and like kids in the hall. Oh, man. Despite his vicious dislike for these children, Mikhail realized their value for the show, uh, telling Vulture, this is the thing that separated Are You Afraid of the Dark from other shows. A writer would come and say that they had this idea for, say, a haunted car. And I would say, that's cool, but who are the kids? I want a story about a couple of kids that have something going on in their lives that is real and has a real kind of conflict that we'd be interested in watching even if we didn't find the haunted car. 
We had real kids with real interesting stories that intersected with whatever the spooky thing was that week. It's more interesting storytelling, something beyond, whoa, the boogeyman is scary. Yeah, I mean, getting more into his whole psychology of, you know, what actually, what, what kind of scary stories affect people, that's really interesting to me. He said he didn't want to do things for the sake of the metaphorical explosion, but rather something that was kind of more insidious, the emotional component. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in an interview with Complex, Mikhail explained how the writers, quote, rarely played the horror for laughs. There was some humor in there, but we didn't go the goosebumps route of the over-the-top silly scenes. We tried to make it feel real, to make the characters feel real. And there was a really interesting piece in Mashable a few years back by Jess Joho called How We Faced Much More Than the Dark in Are You Afraid of the Dark? And in this piece, she speculated why these stories struck a chord for young people, especially at this time when they're entering puberty, when they sort of felt alienated from their own bodies. Uh, I like to quote some of it. She said, kids were both the tellers and subjects of the tales, uniquely grounding Are You Afraid of the Dark in teen perspectives and an important time in their maturation. That's why it had such a lasting impact impact on our generation. From oral traditions to cognitive behavioral therapy, communal narratives serve a powerful function in society. And Are You Afraid of the Dark gave that power of storytelling to kids, helping them confront the real horrors of teen life with its plots, villains, and moral resolutions. Many of the tales in Are You Afraid of the Dark can be seen as mixed metaphors for the sense of displacement wrought by puberty, making things you used to like now seem childish and repulsive. <laughs> dark, but it gets darker. <laughs> the show also captured an even uglier, darker reality from the coming-of-age experience. Only you can save yourself. Adults were regularly portrayed as so comically ineffectual that they needed to be saved by the kids whom they previously disregarded. That's why we love horror, and why it's been a mainstay since the first stories were ever told. We use scary stories to reconcile with the unknowable. And in the case of Are You Afraid of the Dark, it's the uncharted fears of youth, like rejection, isolation, neglect, powerlessness, and the loss of innocence. Crucially, Are You Afraid of the Dark was also willing to let those heroes fail. Not every story told by the Midnight Society ended happily. Sometimes, protagonists fell victim to an eagle too big for them to overcome. Just like life. <laughs> um, it's perhaps no accident that DJ McHale's own daughter couldn't watch this show as a kid because she found it just too terrifying. <laughs> he later told Vulture, My daughter has a very vivid imagination, so even at eight years old, watching Are You Afraid of the Dark was just too scary for her. I keep trying to get her to watch, but she wants nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, back to the kids that they cast. So the results of these grueling casting auditions, which yielded mostly Canadian actors mandated since this was Canadian production, was a bumper crop of young talent, many of whom would become huge stars, including Ryan Gosling. Mikhail wanted to cast the budding heartthrob, but he turned down Are You Afraid of the Dark in favor of doing the famous version of Mickey Mouse Club, uh, that one crazy year when Mickey Mouse Club had Ryan Gosling, Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, and Britney Spears in the cast. Imagine that being on that cast and not one of those people. How, <laughs> yeah. how much would that suck these days? The Pete Best of the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> uh, that took two years in Florida, but Mikhail snagged Ryan Gosling when he journeyed back up to Canada after Mickey Mouse Club wrapped. Nev Campbell, just a few years before uh -huh. her star-making turns in The Craft and Scream, Campbell appeared in the 1994 episode, I am not making this up, The Tale of the Dangerous Soup, <laughs> as the hostess of a restaurant called The Wild Boar, a restaurant renowned for its green-hued dangerous soup priced at $100 a bowl, in which the secret ingredient is fear. <laughs> the secret ingredient is love. Damn it. <laughs> See that? Hayden no? Yeah. Hayden Christensen. Pre-Anakin Skywalker, Christensen played Kirk in the 1999 episode of The Tale of Bigfoot Ridge. Huh. He's also in the, aforem the aforementioned In the Mouth of Madness by John Carpenter. I'm just, have I mentioned John Carpenter in every single episode of Too Much Information? Because if I haven't, I'm not working hard enough. Maybe not the Spice Girls, but... <laughs> uh, future American Pie star Eddie K. Thomas had his first ever screen role in the 1994 episode The Tale of the Curious Camera. Firefly and Serenity star Jewel State appeared in the season three episode, The Tale of Watcher's Woods, and The Tale of the Unfinished Painting in season four. 
And Alicia Cuthbert was in this. Well, I guess when uh, DJ McHale auditioned her to be in the second incarnation of the Midnight Society, he completely forgot that she'd already been in an episode already, The Tale of the Night Shift, and asked her who directed her, at which point she replied, you did. <laughs> Awkward. Burn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was Cuthbert's first ever role on camera, apparently. But the real MVP of uh, AYAOTD... I would. That's harder to say than Are You Afraid of the Dark to me. <laughs> nope. Jay Barrichell, Judd Apatow stock cast player. Oh, is he like Jay Seth Rogen's co writer? Skinny. All yeah, he write, co writes it all. He's the skinny kid with the black hair. He was in four episodes of Are You Afraid of the four. Dark? Four. Four, which I believe makes him the most cast kid. And in his first one, they drowned him to death in a pool. <laughs> So uh, he's a different. Is he a different character in every one? Or does he just keep yeah. coming back as Ghost Kid? Okay, <laughs> Ghost Kid. I mean, hey, just spinning here. It's just we're developing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the tale of Ghost Kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More established guest stars included Melissa Joan Hart, who was four seasons into starring in Clarissa Explains It All when she appeared in The Tale of the Frozen Ghost. Tia and Tamara Mowry, who'd been on Sister Sister for three seasons, they appeared in The Tale of the Chameleons. I don't remember that one. Figure skater Tara Lipinski starred in The Tale of the Lunar Locusts, and Boy Meets World star Will Friedel appeared in The Tale of the Long Ago Locket. That sounds like one of the ones I would have been into. That sounds like yeah. a sad, like, 50s throwback thing. <laughs> also, Bobcat Goldthwaite <laughs> and Gilbert Gottfried. Friend of the pod, uh, Bobcat Goldthwaite. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, guest starred in The Tale of the Final Wish and The Tale yeah. of Station 109.1, respectively. Gottfried, I didn't know this. He was a whore buff. Um, mm. Ron Oliver, who uh, directed and wrote some of these, some of the Already Afraid of the Dark stuff, told a site called Gaily Dreadful um, <laughs> that his bud Tony Timponi, who is editor of Fangoria magazine throughout its glory years, uh, that guy said Gilbert would just come into the Starlog and Fangoria offices in New York and just spend hours reading their back issues, which is adorable. Apparently, Bobcat just ripped his vocal cords to shreds while playing the Sandman in the Tale of the Final Wish. Because he just had to keep saying these limericks over and over again that had nothing to do with the plot whatsoever. They were complete non sequiturs. And so he had no cues. So he kept flubbing his lines because there was just nothing to like spark whatever the next line would be for him. And so he had to do them take after take after take over and over and over and it's just his voice was shot and he just was pounding honey and lemon and tea to preserve <laughs> what was left of it which is just hilarious considering he speaks 90 percent of the time as <laughs> yeah <laughs> so this is what broke him that's my that's my bobcat goldweight Rachel Blanchard, who is a uh, at then at the time five years older than the rest of the society, appeared for three seasons. Uh, her character trademark was "I'm always in a bad mood." Uh, she went on to <laughs> star. She's five in the, years older than the rest of the cast. Yeah. Maybe that's why. Yeah, she's like old enough to drink. She's hanging out with like teenagers. Uh, she went on to star in the Clueless TV series and Seventh Heaven, and as Sally in Flight of the Concord. Ah, uh, yeah, she's the most beautiful girl in the room. Mm -hmm. That's right. I used to play that song at parties and hope that the most beautiful girl in the room would assume I was playing it about her and be flattered and come over and talk to me. And that worked exactly zero times. Um, <laughs> God, playing acoustic guitar at parties in college was such a massive fail. I, it's a fool's errand. Yeah, I know. I mean, piano at least gave you a little bit more mystique as like the quiet, sensitive guy. And it was louder, so it was harder to ignore. But it also <laughs> meant that you were mostly facing the walls you played, whereas with guitar, you couldn't help but look around like hopefully and see who was noticing you. It was, it was bad. Did you ever do that? Uh, no, I knew a guy who used to play Blackbird to girls at parties. Yeah, uh, I, and yeah. he would... Well, no, there's a twist. He oh. would uh, he would walk up to him and be like, hey, I, you know, I'm sorry, I really don't usually do this, but... Um, That's a terrible you know, start right there. Yeah, well, I saw you standing there, and I just, I had to write, I wrote this about no! you. No! And he wouldn't sing it. He wouldn't sing, but he would just play, like, the finger-picking part that everyone could play it. And his reasoning was that if any girl didn't recognize Blackbird, they deserved to be scammed on by him. <laughs> I mean, would they laugh if they did recognize? I, I, this is stupid. Oh, this is dumb. I think it worked. Did he read the More game? Like, this is... No. That's... No, that's, this was pre the game. That was, was my party my... piece, too. That was, like, the most... Probably to this day, the most complicated guitar part I know how to play. I got bad news for you, buddy. It's not that... It's not that... It's not that complicated. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, Alex is being mean to Jordan again. <laughs> Charles S. Dutton. Guest star Charles S. Friend of the pod, Charles S. Dutton. <laughs> 
who appeared in The Tale of Cutter's Treasure, has a glowing review of the show in Clickstein's book Slimed. He said, without a doubt, it was very, very, very well produced. It wasn't like anything you would see on Saturday morning, those rather inexpensive kind of half-hearted children's programs. I never looked at it as a kid's show. I didn't leave there thinking we had done anything amateurish. I looked at it as if we were doing a small movie. Mm. Uh, Frank Gorshin. Frank Gorshin. Famous as the Riddler on the uh, 60s Adam West Batman and Robin show, guested in The Tale of the Carved Stone. That's a good get. That's a really good get. I feel like we got to give a special shout out to a guy by the name of Ross Hall, who played what I assume was the leader of the Midnight Society, since he's the only guy I can really remember, the one with the glasses. Uh, Ironically, for later seasons, he had to take the lenses out of said glasses because the glass was reflecting off the studio lights. Um, oh, yeah, they do that for everybody. Uh, Zoe Deschanel hasn't had, in, in all those episodes of New Girl, she doesn't have any, anything in her glasses. But, but I, that always surprises me because I feel like you could you must be able to tell when it just goes straight through and there's no glass or plastic oh, or yeah, anything in it. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's easier than what, rotoscoping out every individual <laughs> reflection. Uh, uh. Uh, if you were to ask me to describe this guy, I'd say he looks like a TV weatherman. And funnily enough, that's exactly what he grew up to be. Mm-hmm. Ross Hall is a meteorologist for the Canadian Weather Network. And he says that, I don't know why I find this as funny as I do. DJ McHale would help direct the campfire scenes by keeping his voice low and spooky. Like he was a <laughs> member of the Midnight Society just to like keep everyone in the mood, which is creepy, but also kind of cute. It's cute. Yeah. He wanted to get him in the, get him in the spirit. Uh, despite episodes which featured children, um, you know, dying, uh, McHale has said repeatedly there was very little pushback from Nickelodeon about episode or, as he had feared initially, parents writing in with concerns about the show's content. Yeah, this is really surprising to me considering the kids died in a really spectacular spectrum of ways, including but not limited to... A love-struck kid is violently drowned in the school pool by a swamp monster. That's the tale Mm -hmm. of the dead man's float. Maybe that's the one I was thinking of earlier in the pool. Uh, A teen is haunted by the trauma of his dead best friend whose life he failed to save. That's the tale of the shiny red bicycle. A girl gets locked in a room and forgotten until she starves to death. That's the tale of the lonely ghost, which features the, the, the little girl in the room where she just wrote, help me all over the walls. Yeah. Scary. Uh, Hmm. And then there's another where a ghost boy freezes to death after hiding in the woods to get away from a criminal. The tale of the frozen ghost. So, yeah, it's not just that they it's not just that this show featured death, but really really kind of sadistic levels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But there was one thing that the network did mandate in uh, 91 episodes of the show, all of which featured a campfire. Only once do you see a child light a match. I have heard twice, but we will okay. we'll come back to that. Okay. Continue. Well, he said you couldn't show kids striking a match because they didn't want to teach kids how to do that and risk some kids accidentally burning down their homes. There's one that did slip through. Uh, he said, in an episode I directed, Mia Kirshner was to star in that episode, and in the scene she had to light a lantern, and she didn't know how to strike a match. He said we practically had to fake it because she was like, I've never done this before. Which I guess maybe gives credibility to Nickelodeon's theory that we didn't want to teach kids how to light a match. Um, it might have also been a fire hazard because uh, they used real foliage to dress these interior sets where they shot the campfire scenes. And because they would shoot them in these marathon sessions without striking the set in between, by the end of it, like week two or three, the whole thing would basically be a dried up tinder box <laughs> that could go up. At the proverbial strike of a match, he said they they nearly got shooting uh, shut down at one point because the uh, <laughs> the firemen came to the set and were like, "You got a lot of uh, a lot of dead foliage and branches and stuff lying around, and you're shooting around your fire, a, a campfire, yeah, sitting around your campfire scene. It's the hoser. Mounties coming in, <laughs> yeah, you hoser. I read that there was another match." incident that slipped through uh during one episode when the midnight society were trying and failing to light the fire they lit a match but the logs wouldn't burn which is maybe a worse lesson to show kids like don't worry Mm. nothing will happen but then one of the other kids succeeds in lighting the fire by rubbing two sticks together the old caveman method you're an eagle scout did you ever succeed in doing that by rubbing the two sticks together and starting a fire i've never seen anyone do it really Mm. not a single person for one of the levels you have to light a fire successfully with and all you get are two matches and then you if you 
go over, you flunk. So it's just like you have to make sure you're a really well constructed Tinder situation. I've seen people do it with Lynn, but mm. I've never seen the rubbing the two sticks together thing. Um, speaking of campfires, as no doubt the listenership of this show has been waiting for with yeah, this is the big moment. Bated breath. The true nature of the mysterious dust sprinkled on the campfire at the beginning of each episode. Drum roll, please. Punch that in. Mike, give us a drum roll. Uh, it's powdered non-dairy creamer and glitter. <laughs> <laughs> give me a thousand guesses. I never would have guessed that. Um, that stuff's petroleum-based, and it actually burns, Mikhail told Vulture. Then we added some pyrotechnics in the fire itself, but Cremora does burn and gives off a little smoke. He said Cremora, but in the Vulture article, they actually write, he may have been using it as people refer to Kleenex for tissues. It was not the actual brand Cremora because actor Daniel DeSanto said in a different interview to the Globe and Mail, I came on the third season, was so excited for the magic dust used in the fire, but it's just a bag of coffee mate and glitter. <laughs> so if you or a loved one worked on the set of Are You Afraid of the Dark and you can confirm the brand of non-dairy creamer used to make the fire do its thing, we'll Venmo you five bucks. <laughs> My eternal offer to anyone who helps gives you this. what you want. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Too Much Information in just a moment. Speaking of uh, what we'll loosely call special effects, the SFX chief in Are You Afraid of the Dark is a guy named Steve Kolbach, who later went on to win a whole bunch of Emmys for Game of Thrones. You just italicized Game of Thrones. No one's going to read our Shh. script that we're reading right now. Shh. Why are you going through on the Google Doc? I have and a disease. The show? I have a disease. Let me work. <laughs> Oh, as Heigl's copy editing my script that no one will ever see. Um, this special effects guy has talked about how Are You Afraid of the Dark was an important training ground for him because, in his words, they could never afford to fake things. For example, the twisted claw that was used in one episode that was just a petrified turkey claw, which is gross. That's the monkey's paw episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yes, yes, yes. But without, you know, budget or technology for CGI, they had to get creative. And he's talked about how in the episode, The Tale of the Headless Horseman, he had to figure out a way to show a boy getting chased across a bridge and then the horse and its rider bursting into flames. And ironically, for the last season of Game of Thrones, he had to work out a similar effect based on what he learned on Are You Afraid of the Dark, which I think is funny. And speaking of ways the influence of Are You Afraid of the Dark has lived on, I heard a rumor, I wasn't able to confirm this, that M. Night Shyamalan was supposedly inspired to make The Sixth Sense from a season three episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark called The Tale of the Dream Girl. Mm. And this episode centers around a boy who's ignored by everyone around him, except for a girl who turns out to be a ghost. I guess he's the right demographic for that. Yeah. I just love to imagine this guy, Steve Colbeck, on the set of uh, Game of Thrones, and they're like, oh, God, how are we going to set this horse on fire? And he takes a long like, drag of a cigarette, and he's like, sit down, on. kid, I got a story to tell you. <laughs> oh, I can get you a flaming horse with I rider. You. you want a flaming horse? I'll get you a flaming horse. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, and this ties into our, our next bit, writer-director Ron Oliver remembers a specific episode that Nick Lillian did have notes on, the werewolf yarn, the tale of the full moon which he said he heard studio chatter that it was a bit too, quote, John Waters meets David Lynch, which rules. Mm. Um, he added that he thought that one in particular was banned in Britain because two kids break into the werewolf's house and, and the British didn't want to seem like they were condoning breaking and entering because um, they're so proper. How many people die? How many people die <laughs> yeah. in this series? The children drowning is fine. It's the it's the B and E we're really worried about. Um, but that particular episode was written by Oliver Ron Oliver to have a specific emotional subtext. It was his first script for the show, and as a gay man, he said it is definitely about a family dealing with how to tell their kid that his uncle is gay. In our case, I just made him a werewolf. <laughs> but the rest of it is the same. As the father says. There are lots of different kinds of families, Jed. This is ours. Mm -hmm. um, and then he added, I do know a couple of our kid actors came to me many years later, having come out as gay, and thanked me for being a positive influence as an out gay man in the industry as far back as the late 80s. So I'm proud of that. 
And this ties into the next part, which is what we continually talk about as we talk about all these Nickelodeon shows of this era of how progressive they were in their in their casting. There were two big mandates with casting, Mikhail told Vox in 2015. Besides good, diversity <laughs> was a big one. In the oral history slimed, uh, the actor Jason Alisherian told Clickstein, DJ McHale was way ahead of his time in making sure that his show represented all kids, not just white kids. There was absolutely no problem with there being interracial relationships on the show. And again, this wasn't commonplace for 1992. They didn't think it was even worthwhile to comment on it. Instead, they just played like it was normal, which is the greatest testament to representing diversity on a show. And hilariously, McHale told Vox that, quote, often a kid got nixed by Nickelodeon because they were too Disney. Hmm. Apple pie, freckles, cute, over the top acting. They were like, this is a Disney kid. Get rid of him. You got to do this <laughs> cigar chopping executive. No Disney kids. <laughs> And I think, and this is him talking, I think this is one of the things that made Nickelodeon so great. If it smacked of Disneyana, they wouldn't do it. And their efforts resulted in an NAACP award nomination in 1996. And gender-wise, Ron Oliver added in the slimed oral history, I'd like to say Are You Afraid of the Dark was a boys show, but I have a feeling that it was split down the middle because we'd switch off every episode with there being a girl protagonist or a boy protagonist. They were quite conscious of that at Nickelodeon. We were one of the first shows that actually tried to straddle the middle line and succeeded at it. Round of applause for Are yeah. You Afraid of the Dark. Um, that Inco iconic theme music. Speaking of nothing in particular, segue. Uh, incredibly, for a show of this nature, and one produced in the cut-rate, poutine-drenched wasteland of Montreal, <laughs> Are You Afraid of the Dark had an original score for every episode. Uh, Mikhail told Vulture, we scored each show individually like they were short films, which was necessary because each show was so different. With spooky stories, music plays a huge part. Uh, the show's music director and composer, Jeff Zahn, explained to artofthetitle.com, I thought it best to bring in about 10 writers and have them write samples of their work, and I would direct the process. We found two fabulous composers to share the load. At some point, we discussed the opening sequence, but I don't remember if they gave me any footage or a script first, or if I wrote the music alone. I'm pretty sure I wrote a music piece about one minute long with just the outline of the series in my head, and they edited the visuals to that. It turned out to be the horror of commercial air travel in Canada that inspired the theme. <laughs> I was actually sitting in Dorval Airport in Montreal, and I started singing the theme while waiting for my planes on Continued. I just thought about the series, about mystery, hauntings, scary, supernatural things, thrillers, and kids. And it came to me. I didn't have music paper, so I scribbled out the notes on a napkin. I really liked it and kept singing it. Then when I played it on piano, the important counter melody came to me, which I used as an introduction and for linking material. It's funny to me in that interview, they keep asking him, they're like, what do you think is like makes a successful TV theme? And multiple time he brings up the Sopranos opening credits. Alabama threes uh, woke up this morning. So that's what he <laughs> considers a, a it's a great. It's great. But that song whips. That was yeah. my dad's workout song for the longest time. Oh, so nice. it will always be fused with my dad on the elliptical machine. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I I just listened to the Are You Afraid of the Dark theme as we started this episode. Like, how do you even hum that piece of music? I yeah, it's I like don't a think melodic. It, it does yeah. not have a particularly stirring melody. No, no. I mean, it's just it's it's a, it's an amazing sound design, but yeah. like yeah, I, I. So he's talking about like singing it to himself at the airport. I'm just I can't imagine that. But uh, but the way it pairs with the visuals is so good. That opening sequence is incredible yeah. because I mean, pretty much across the board, it manages to avoid cliche. It's not like you know a coffin and all the like tales from the yeah. crypt type stuff. It's like a robo bobbing on the water at night or like a rusted creaking swing set stuff that's scary but i i can't articulate why it just is all unsettling and unnerving it's so good um once it debuted the show was basically a linchpin of uh the snick programming block but the placement actually kind of came after they had everything in hand the ratings were really really high mikhail said uh, I don't know who the guy or woman was who came up with the idea, but they said, you know, there's a group of people who on Saturday night are too young to be on a date and too old to be in bed, and they're watching <laughs> TV. And that's when they created Snick. It was as much Snick as Are You Afraid of the Dark, if not more, that became a phenomenon. He continued, I really tip my cap to Nickelodeon for putting the right shows on at the right time, which nobody had done before. Nobody had ever programmed Saturday nights for kids. Usually it was just Saturday morning programming for kids, but Nickelodeon had the foresight to program Saturday nights as well. That was brilliant. Uh, 
So the first SNCC lineup went from 8 to 10 p.m. with four half-hour shows. The 8 p.m. show was a sitcom. Clarissa explains it all. Melissa Joan Hart. The 8.30 p.m. show was the comedy variety show Roundhouse. Then the 9 p.m. show was really what they built the whole thing around. That was Ren and Stimpy, which was the huge breakout hit at the time. And then if you were staying up that late to see the latest thing, that was Are You Afraid of the Dark at 9.30. Yeah, the sequencing on SNCC was really brilliant, like a good album. I mean, the Ren and Snippy humor really put you in the right headspace for Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, yeah, and I never really thought about the fact that it was on later, weeded out some of the younger kids who probably shouldn't be watching that anyway. Yeah. There is sort of a bizarre continuity to this show that we alluded to a little bit earlier because of the rights situation, um, which is best explained in Mikhail's words. He said, when we finished our run in 1996, after we had done 65 episodes, and 65 episodes was the gold number back then, I went back and did a deal with Disney for some other things. The reason I went back to Nickelodeon to do two more seasons of Are You Afraid of the Dark was not because of the network. It was because of the Canadian producer who had the rights to the show all around the world. All of their five-year licenses on the show were running out, so they wanted foreign broadcasters to relicense the show. And to sweeten the pot, they said, how about if we make new episodes? So I had agreed to do more. As always, greed. <laughs> Filthy lucre. He said to Vulture, Nickelodeon played a lesser role in the second group of episodes because they weren't the primary broadcaster anymore. But they still wanted the show and aired all the episodes. For the most part, though, there were no changes made other than to cast a new Midnight Society. The biggest difference in this second stretch of shows is that Mikhail was just not as involved as he had been in the first run. He was not physically in Montreal for the filming. He was not involved in the day-to-day -day production except to kind of offer comments from afar. He didn't direct any more episodes, but he did work on the scripts from home. I uh, worked with the editors and the, and the music supervisors. Um, again... DJ McHale, quote machine. He said, so if you liked the show, you can congratulate me. If you didn't like the show, it was also my fault. <laughs> um, but by the time the second incarnation of the show hit, Nickelodeon, he said, was already moving away from doing dramas, which is a decision that he puts down primarily to budget. Comedies are much cheaper to do, he said. and Kids love comedies. So they went with the lowest common denominator. They figured they had a better chance of getting a hit with a comedy than a drama. The networks just want to go the easy route which is comedy. And then he added that he actually developed another horror show for Nick following Are You Afraid of the Dark in 2000 or 2001. He said it took two years for this show to develop until they finally said, you know, DJ, we're just not doing dramas anymore. We just don't want to do them. It's a shame because this show actually seems pretty cool. It was called The Strange Legacy of Cameron Cruz. And it was about a psychic kid who would solve ghost stories and other supernatural cases. They actually made a pilot of this with Jesse McCartney, which is interesting. Remember him? Hmm, yeah. Yeah. But McHale really never felt like the network was all in for All You Afraid of the Dark, probably stemming from the fact that they originally passed on his pitch the first time around. <laughs> yeah. And this sense continued even after the show became a big hit. He later said, I've always felt that since All You Afraid of the Dark ended, I've never felt the love from Nickelodeon. Maybe it's the whole comedy thing since they've been getting away from dramas, but I never felt like they thought, wow, we really have this gem that we have the complete rights to. We can show it until the magnetic particles fall off. It really, it did. Like, I mean, it's just what you said. It did kind of just go away after a while. Yeah. There was, however, very nearly an Are You Afraid of the Dark feature film back in the late 90s. Mikhail said, I did write an Are You Afraid of the Dark movie called The Tale of the Wicked Gift for Paramount. It was an original story about the boogeyman who was conjured centuries before by an ancient tribe as a means to discipline children. Ooh. <laughs> Part, the project never really went anywhere because the folks who ran Paramount at the time didn't get that you could make a movie like that, meaning horror light. They felt that horror had to either be true horror or Scooby-Doo funny. It's too bad. I went back and read that script recently and it's really good. It's never too late. Uh, meanwhile, it was announced in November 2011 that a film adaptation of the series was in works at Paramount from a guy who would go on to write it, Gary Doberman, and <laughs> producer Matt Kaplan, who did To All the Boys I've Loved Before, uh, with extreme workmanlike director DJ Caruso, who did Disturbia and Triple X Return of Xander Cage on the big screen, episodes of The Shield, Smallville, and Dark Angel on TV would have been directing. So the movie certainly would have had a director who would have <laughs> directed it. The film originally had an October 2019 release date, but uh, eight months before that, Paramount just quietly removed it from their schedule, which is a bummer 
And sadly, this is as good a time as any to delve into why the show took so long to make it to streaming. As of 2014, Mikhail explained its absence on streamers to Complex, saying, The show is co-owned by Viacom Nickelodeon on one side, and then this Canadian company, Sinar, who were the show's financiers. They have complete control over it. Um, so for a long time, you could only watch it on like YouTube, essentially. Now I think it's on uh, Paramount+. Plus. Uh, maybe even on Netflix. Jordan? I'm still seeing it on uh, YouTube quite a bit. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, seemingly like illegal versions, not to blow up anybody's spot. But <laughs> anyway, as of 2014, Mikhail had moved into young, uh, the realm of YA, young adult fiction. Uh, I mentioned to Complex, I actually have a pitch out to Amazon now to do a similar series, and I am waiting to hear back from them. Now it's online companies who are doing interesting things. It's Netflix and Amazon. If Amazon doesn't want to do the spooky show I've pitched, I'm going to do it as a book series. So obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> that was 2014. Yeah. yeah. I think he has a book series now called Pendragon. I yeah. Think he's the, a successful the, like fantasy author yeah. at this point. I can't imagine Mikhail warmed much to Nickelodeon when the network brought Are You Afraid of the Dark back for a reboot in 2019 and didn't ask him to participate. Ooh. This is according to an article on Den of Geek. Apparently, this left some bitter feelings and bad blood with the network, but at least he was complimentary about this reboot, or at least the first of the three seasons. He told Den of Geek, One of the things I said to the producer was, be careful because you're making a show that people who are in their 30s have great memories of, and chances are you're not going to live up to those memories. And those memories are probably better than the show was, frankly. You're not really making a show for them because they've moved on. You're really making a show for the same age group that we made it for. And they did. I think they hit just the right tone. I think they've done the show a good service. I'd be really upset if they somehow ruined it, but they didn't. So that's good. <laughs> Damned with faint Be praise. Begrudging acceptance. Yeah. Did you know there was a book series of this? I didn't. Launched no, I didn't. undoubtedly to compete with the Goosebumps series. Created by John Peel. Unfortunately, not the iconic British DJ of the same name, but a ah. different John P, a different British John Peel, who uh, specializes in TV series tie-ins and novelizations. Oh my God! Wait, I think he did one for the Avengers movie with Ray Fiennes and Uma Thurman. Did you I have it? I, Was it written under yeah, his pseudonym John Vincent or Nicholas Adams? No, did it was you John have his... Peel. It was John Peel because I remember thinking, wait a minute, Emma Peel is a Emma character Peel, in this John movie, Peel. and mm. John Peel, yeah. Did you read his uh, Carmen Sandiego, Doctor Who, or Star Trek novelizations? No, none were English enough for me. What about his series, James Bond Jr.? Oh, that is English enough for me, but I didn't read that. <laughs> uh, there was an Are You Afraid of the Dark board game? Oh, huh. yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. Right. Well, was there a video game? I'm kind of shocked there wasn't. Or like eh. an educational computer game? Oh, or like, like a Doom-related, like... <laughs> No? Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to throw in a quick It Belongs in a Museum segment. The clown doll from the season three episode, The Tale of the Crimson Clown, was put on eBay and sold for $11,597 and then was later resold, apparently, for half a million dollars. Holy shit. I have not been able to confirm this, but it's shown up on various trivia listicles, so... Make of that what you will. I just found that interesting. Well, you know, for uh, AYAOTD fans, um, the show's second revival began in October 2019, was renewed for a second and third season, uh, the most recent of which premiered just this year, July of 2022. So there you go. That's fun. They get You got that going for you, which is uh, which is nice. I am afraid of jinxing what has been one of our shorter episodes, <laughs> honestly, uh, without detours into international maritime law <laughs> but uh to be honest and to be more to the point uh as just a horror nerd you know i have nothing but good things to say about are you afraid of the dark i'm mm, i'm happy that there was nothing creepy like like actually creepy lurking under the hood here and that it was just yeah. like a well-made series made with love that people are still getting joy from so Allow me to close this out by saying submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. This has been the tale of too much information. <laughs> I'm Alex Agel. And I'm Jordan Rontag. We'll catch you next time. Too 
Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The supervising producer is Mike Johns. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 